Sorry, the intro, sorry. Sure. Okay, so posting in five, four, three, two. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Wednesday afternoon, and time for our weekly Android EMEA Developer Relations Office Hours Hangout, where uh, from Munich, Germany, and London, UK, we will answer any and all questions about Android development that you might want to pose to the EMEA DevRel team. So with that, let's go ahead and start hanging out. So just a quick note from, hi, this is Nick Butcher here in London. We have a special guest joining us live in person. We have a real-life Android developer. <laughs> uh, this is Yuhani, who, those of you who might not know, uh, runs a most excellent blog called AndroidUIPatterns.com. So if you have uh, not heard of it, or I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, he dishes out fantastic advice about uh, crafting sublime UIs and how to do things the android way. Uh, so we're very lucky to have him here joining us in person. So, uh, yeah, any questions for Johan as well, please feel free to either join the Hangouts, um, ask them in the comments, or add them to the moderator that we should posted. So, while people are a bit shy and haven't joined the Hangout just yet, Sparky, do you have any questions that anyone has asked in advance? Well, I can have... Uh, Ah, oh, sorry, Tal. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, um, I want to ask a question about. I need to post a picture to send the picture to the to a web service, but I can only send the stuff through using get. I cannot use post. So how would I be able to do that? Wow. I suppose you could take those bytes and just stuff them into the uh, stuff them into the URL. A few at a time. That sounds like a really bad idea. Yeah. Like, wh why can you not use post? Because that's the because that's how my workplace works. At they cannot, they don't use post. They only use get. It's not yeah. something dependent on me. It's on dependent on the other side. Wow! If I had to choose only one protocol to support, get wouldn't be it. <laughs> I was just wondering, is this the first time that you have to do this kind of uh, Yeah, this is the first time I have to do such a thing. Okay, so no, nobody else in your organization is doing this, maybe from... Well, in my organization, I'm the only one who develops for Android. They use, they usually, the other stuff is developed for websites, so... Okay. okay. Is, FTP, is FTP or SFTP not an option? Uh, no, they just said get used to use that if I can. <laughs> okay, well, I'm no expert on web transfer um, protocols, but I think you're going to have a tough time with that. Is there any way you can do anything with a um, uh, SHR or anything like that? Uh, well, I'll check it out, but I know I cannot use post for sure. Okay. Uh, so because I know post would be the easiest solution, unless I'm mistaken. Are you able to are you able to use any other Google services like so this is this is an Android could you for example have the uh, photo sent up to Picasa or Google Plus Photos and then in your get just pass a URL to the you know to pass the durable URL to the asset on Google Plus and not have to fetch it directly off the phone. Well, I can use that because basically you're right. Everybody who has Android usually has a Google account. So as a result of that, I can upload it somewhere and then use the URL from there to keep the link to the picture. Yes, that could be a good idea. Uh, awesome. Yeah, that, uh, we'll check that out. But that's a, that's a nice solution. Uh, yeah. We'll check that out and see where that leads me. Okay, Thank good luck. You. People in the comments are asking for the Hangout link. Have we not posted the link properly? Do I need to do something else? Um, the Hangout link should be, it should be somewhere in proximity to the, to the uh, live stream, I think. Well, I connected if somehow. If not, well, Tal, we invited you. Oh, really? I didn't um, see that. Yeah, special. If not, then then they should post in the comments and say, please let me in, and and then Nick can let them in. I think I've invited it opened up to everyone I can. Hopefully they can see it. Okay. I know that that's how uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how uh, they, they do it in Mountain View, is that they actually have a moderator who sits there and lets people in one at a time. Mm. Last time I was there on a, last week at 12 p.m., they let everybody, I will just press join in and it let me. I didn't ask anybody to join. Oh, well. Maybe because... It might be only the first time. It might just be the first time you have to do that. Hmm. I'm not sure. Or maybe because you let me in here, it also applies to the mountain view. Because it's maybe. the same account. Maybe, maybe. That's right. We're your back door to access. <laughs> Sorry, I sent by these folks. Um, hopefully, people can see the, the link and join us now. But in the meantime, do you have any more questions, Sparky, that you, people have pre queued up? The the, the one question that I'd really been wrestling with was the one that uh, Mitchell asked a couple of weeks ago uh, in Stack Overflow where he wanted to know, he had some questions about uh, views and layouts and things, and he's got a dialogue that when he grows it up past a certain size, it just basically pops and goes full screen, and he wants to know what causes that. And, and now I'm really curious, I want to know what causes it too. It's, uh, it's, it's not the same on every device. So it, it happens at a different number of DPs based you know, on, on my Zoom tablet, on my uh, Galaxy Nexus phone. It doesn't happen at all on uh, Galaxy Tab 10 inch. Don't know if that's because it's a Samsung firmware or if it's because it's, uh, um, because it's Honeycomb instead of ICS. So we're still looking into it. Uh, Nick, you had sort of posted a hint, so I might track that one down. Um, this, you know, this, this uh, dimension about the, the uh, preferred minimum and maximum width of a dialog mm -hmm. in, the, in the layout manager. So that's where I'm going to go next. Okay. So it seems like quite a few people are managing to join us. Hi, Lucas. I think Al's managed to join us and Stephen as well. So, hi, guys. Ah, and you have Mikhail following along here, adding comments to the stream as well. So There's an interesting problem. This is um, using a dialogue fragment, and on Honeycomb, um, it would respect the bit parent. Is that right, Sparky? Yeah. yeah right. Basically, basically, right. What happens is it, it acts like an ordinary dialogue box up until he grows it to 895 dps, and then it goes boing into full screen mode. Uh, with, with just a little bit of margin around the edges. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't happen at that size on my, dis on my device. On my device, it happens at 915 dps. But the effect is still the same. It goes from being a center dialog to a full screen dialog, um, just by virtue of the size that you instantiate it at. And you can, you can force it by setting uh, Android minimum width in the, in the layout parameters. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, I, I took a, a quick look at this question, and um, by some rough math, this is about 65%. It seems once you exceed the width of that, um, it seems to go full screen. And there is a suspect sounding uh, dimension in the, in the in platform version 15 called dialog min width major at 65%. So I. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a minimum, though. We're talking about a maximum width. Yeah. So, so there might be something similar defining where. Right. Uh, it goes full screen, so it's around about 90% of the full width, I think. Okay. So it, it seems to be happening somewhere between 90, somewhere between 89 and 92%, except on my Galaxy Tab where it doesn't happen at all. Which is running Honeycomb, right? That's right. Yeah, so you said it works fine on Honeycomb, it's just like yes. Yep. Okay. Okay, so I guess we'll have to <laughs> keep on looking into that one. And maybe get back to you. That's right. So any of these new joiners who are uh, in the comments, it seems, want to either jump into the Hangout and come ask us a question live, or feel free to ask any questions in the comments. Is there anything we can help with? Or Tal, do you have any more questions? Um, I had one more question. Um, well, well, 
I just forgot right now one second what it what was it um with the add oh yeah with the horizontal scroll view I have one um well how can I play let's say I've got a list of items that I placed on a sc horizontal scroll view how can I make it to start in the middle of the scroll view if you see what I mean so it would when the screen appears in front of the person it starts from the middle and not from the left yeah so anyone done that before is there not a scroll to position function? Yeah. Hmm. For well, I tried scroll to unscroll by, but I, the problem was that it used it before the item was loaded up, so as a result, it didn't actually work. So I was looking for something else. So scroll to position, did you say? Yeah. I have not done that. Scroll two, that's not the same thing. Okay, maybe there isn't one, at least not not as a direct method. It might be inherited. So I need to inherit it and then uh, use it? Well, I don't know. Uh, I haven't done this before, I'm just making guesses. Mm -hmm. Because again, scroll by and scroll to don't work unless you already loaded up the object onto the screen. Right. I was thinking more like like a list view, which actually counts the positions, mm -hmm. um, not just a pixel location, but actually knows the number of items and and you mm. can choose which item it is. Okay. Well, I don't have an answer for you right away. That was my best guess. Okay, so I'll look towards some to inheriting it and see if something might pop up. Maybe I admit I, I I'm not seeing anything in the uh, I'm not seeing anything in in the, the documentation right now. So it, yeah, it has a scroll to method, right? Where you can you can tell it where to scroll to. It's just, uh, when do you need to invoke that? I need to invoke it as soon as the activity starts. So what in your on review? Uh, not on resume, on, uh, on create. Mm -hmm. On create, I needed to start from the middle, not from the left. Oh, only on that year, okay. But the, pro but the problem is that the, because it takes time for the items to load up, if I use scroll to too early, it doesn't respond to it. It responds to it, but it doesn't do the effect because there's nothing to scroll to. Mm -hmm. Because the list is still empty or something like that. Yeah. Well, you, another thing you could do is maybe um, just sort of has it, have it like as a delayed effect. So rather than scrolling right away, you you set a, a member variable that that notes where it should be, and then you can sort of watch for when your list is fully populated, and then once that happens, mm -hmm. then you can get it to scroll. How can I know when my when my uh, horizontal scroll view is fully populated? If you see what I mean. Um, wh when do I know? When do I catch that event? By so that? Yeah. It? Wait five seconds. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How are you populating it? How uh, am I populating it? I am just adding uh, items to Horizon because it's something that comes from a web service. I'm taking the items and then adding them to the horizontal scroll view. So you're adding it yourself in another method? Is that on the same? On no, it's on a different method that I'm adding. Are you, are you using a content provider? Um, no, I'm just add, I'm just creating it because it's a it's a button that I add inside the horizontal scroll view, so it's adding more and more buttons. It depends mm. on the amount of items, but each item is basically mm. a button. Okay, but it sounds to me like uh, you did quite a lot of custom stuff. Maybe you could create a custom control, which you know you have more control over how to. Scroll, so you can inherit from the scroll view, and you can set it up to have uh, an event fire when it's loaded its last item, and then you know act accordingly. Okay, could be a, a potential way to do it. But it sounds like if you're in control of when you finish loading items into it, then you need to you know react to the end of that event, and then do some logic. So okay, so I should just catch the point where it finishes loading the items, and that would be able. Yeah, that sounds good. 
Okay. Thank you. Cool. So we have some more live participants. Stephen has joined us. How are you doing, Stephen? Is a a recent photo? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking maybe from about three days ago. <laughs> Did you have a question? You can ask. Sorry, Stephen is tapping away in the chat for those watching along on, on YouTube. Um, so he's tapping out some questions in the chat. So his question is on moderator. Have you got the moderator up as well? Can you see it? Oh, um, I do not have the moderator up yet. I was trying to. I was trying to find it. Here's another great suggestion from Michael, which has come through in the comments for you, Tal. Uh, Michael suggests you can use an async task to uh, fetch the data, and then in its on post execute method, uh, which is synchronized with the UI thread, you can then use the scroll to method. So that's another good suggestion. Just um, be careful of the normal dangers of async tasks. Make sure you're handling rotation and other such events appropriately. OK, thank you. But it's a good suggestion. Thank you, Michael. Loading content into a web view. So, yeah, Sparky, apparently Stephen has a question about loading content into a web view, if you can see it. There it is. Let's see. Wait, I'm sorry, is this the one about the, the allocated RAM? No. It was a question about populating a web view. Let me refresh. Yeah, uh, in the comments, uh, Stephen saying, basically we're seeing a large spike in heat when loading a file to be displayed. It's too much of an XS file, about 2.5 megabytes. Ah, welcome, Mr. Sutton, for showing this. At last, yeah, plug-in problem on the browser. Ha. OK, so we're just chatting about a question. All right. So, see, are you trying to load a static file? Is this a file downloaded from the web that you're... It's basically a massive DOM, is it, that you're trying to load into the web? And this is what is causing the app to crash, or you're getting out of memory exceptions. Right, OK. <laughs> right, so the question is getting out of memory exceptions when trying to load a massive DOM, two and a half meg DOM, into a web view. Yeah, it seems entirely possible that you could just be allocating objects faster than the garbage collector can keep up with you. I, that seems reasonable to me. It also depends on how you're reading the original file. If, you, if you're loading it there into, uh, depends on how you're passing the XML or how are you are you reading the file. Is it, a, is it an HTML file? What kind of file is it? Are you preloading it into a buffer and then putting it into the web view or how, how is it working? HTML stored on disk. Yes, but when it's being loaded in programmatically. He's in stream reader. OK. Directly. So is, is it loading directly into a web view? Or? Because you don't have to. You don't have to draw HTML directly into, oh, there we go, using HTTP GET. OK, that's actually, I think that's a good thing, because that means that the, right, you're not, actually, you're not incurring the overhead of, of doing it in anything that renders. Yeah. But in any case, it means that they might have multiple copies, as he says there, because it should be just direct. Right. 
maybe some uh, good stepping through for the debugger. Yeah, maybe use a, like try to parse it without creating a string buffer, perhaps. Can you just pass a URI to the web view instead? Yeah, there we go. I think I think you can instantiate a web view with a URI, right? No, you navigate directly to it. Should just try it. We'll load URL take it. Is that just a string? looking at the docs on, on WebView, making for riveting YouTube live watching. Well, it seems to me that rather than having us spend all our time pouring through the documentation, we should, uh, we should hear some, some user experience war stories to, to fill the time. Yeah. Has anyone mentioned the um, talk uh, Patrick Dubois did at I.O. 2011 last year on memory profiling. I'll put up a link. Yeah, oh, for using maps and so on, yeah. Yeah, that might be useful in tracing what's actually causing the web view to eat so much memory. That's a good call. I'm guessing that might be what Stephen's using to produce his numbers he's got. Hmm. You know, Patrick works in Munich now. Maybe I could uh, get him on sometime as a guest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great talk. Stephen is typing. So yeah, that might help you kind of determine exactly what's going on and, and where it's going on. But um, I've got a feeling you might be able to pass a, U a URI to the web view. I can't remember. I haven't done it for a while. Uh, but worth looking into, I guess. If that saves the requirement of having to have two copies of the data, like you say, one in a temporary stream, uh, stream and then one in the WebView itself. Yeah, that is a load URL method, but it does have to work for a uh, report. I'd have to try it already. But that is a good point, actually. Yeah, so why don't we have Yuhani here in the room with us? Let's take advantage of his, um, his knowledge and ask you a question. So if you give one piece of advice to Android developers out there for creating apps with better UI, what would it be? Read the, read the design guidelines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go to developer.android.com slash design and assimilate all the knowledge therein. <laughs> but seriously, um, is um, there any kind of mistakes you see people making quite often? Or? Well, Quite a lot of the applications for, for built for Android is built for developers who are really passionate about what they do, but they don't. They fail to think. Oh, I understand that they're not their own users. Well, sometimes they are, but if they're building applications, they should understand that they, even though they can use it, it doesn't mean that everybody else can use it. So, what you should do, if if possible, um, try to put the application in front of other people, like not the friends from your office, uh, just recruit your family or go to a coffee, buy a coffee to somebody and, and tell them to check out the email, whatever whatever your application do, just create a real life scenario and tell them to, how would you read an email using this email client or whatever your, your application is doing. Mm -hmm. And that will reveal you a lot of things mm -hmm. because the real life users, they do different things. And go to your mom, go to your dad, they're going to be confused by the UI. Yeah. Um, Work from there. My girlfriend is the best tester. She can break anything. <laughs> um, that that I couldn't agree more with that, that sentiment. I often see applications, and they're you know because we're developers and we're very technical, um, and we kind of understand intuitively like how to use a lot of the, uh, kind of advanced functionality. You see a lot of apps which uh, you know have lots of settings and things like that. So quite often developers say, "Oh, just throw it in the settings," or you know, it might not do exactly what you want, but you dive into settings and you have to change it. I think it's really important to bear in mind that most of your users probably aren't like us and don't really have this kind of deep technical understanding or intuition, and that 
you know, things like sensible defaults will be um, a customizable setting every single time in my view. Yeah. Oh, I've got a big question come through. Come through. So, yes. in the comments, Oren asks, question, I have two surface views, one for OpenGL rendering and another for camera preview. I actually don't want the surface view of the camera to show, but Z-ordering won't work. So I'm looking for a way to hide the camera preview surface view. Currently, I just make it very small, but looking for a better solution. Right. Well, that the, the surface view isn't a real view, right? It's actually a like a, a hole in your view hierarchy. You can I mean, you can declare the surface view to be above or below, I believe, the rest of your views. So you might be able to uh, pass a parameter to stick it all the way down on the bottom and hide something else on top of it and put something opaque over it. That might work. Um, I don't, I've never tried putting the surface view actually off screen. Has anyone ever tried that? No, I've not tried that, but already my warning signals are going up that you're trying to use the camera but not have it on screen. Sounds a bit scary to me. Can yeah, you give some I clarification what, why you're doing that? Oh, no. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, just a second, I'll turn on the camera. Great. I'll show you the app. It's not that scary. Hey. Hey. Very great of you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> okay. You can see me. I'll yeah. try to show uh, the, to put the camera on the app so you can see it. Can you see something? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this is the app. Uh, what I'm, I'm doing here is... Uh, just a second. Okay. This is the app. And the app shows uh, my face, and it overlay on my face a costume. Okay. For example, uh, like you have in the new Hangout API, I think. Uh, you see, it detects the face, and it, it puts a, a sprite on my face. And I'm doing it, doing it on OpenGL. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is a texture, a texture that is uh, rendered uh, on OpenGL and from the camera preview. And I also have, I don't know if you can show it to you, too small, but there is a dot of the camera preview surface that I don't want to show it to show up on, on top of the OpenGL uh, surface view. I see, so you got like a one by one pixel. Yeah, and uh, I tried to, uh, there is a function I think that control the Z ordering, um, but it didn't work. Uh, so maybe there is an option to put uh, the, the surface of the camera in negative coordinates so it won't uh, show up in, inside the, the, this view. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the only, thing, the only uh, reason I need it is because... Because uh, camera needs you to set a preview yeah. in order to fire at the camera. I, ju I just want the, the buffer of, uh, from the camera, the, the, the preview buffer. I don't want... Uh, to render the camera preview because I'm doing it on my own. Yeah. Have you looked into texture view at all? So instead of setting a, a surface view, could you set a texture view for the camera? Because then that'll like actually give you a callback in order to do some OpenGL processing on each on each frame, right? Uh, well, I thought about it, but uh, I want to take this up and support uh, lower Android version. I think texture view is only from Honeycomb and above, right? Uh, ICS and above, yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure if it's a good option. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is the question. Is there is a, a way to... Uh, me back again. Is there a way to change the Z order or uh, maybe to give it a negative position? Yeah. Is there any possibility of making it transparent? Would that work for you? Uh, I don't think I can make it transparent because uh, the, the camera preview has been rendering to it. Okay. It's something I cannot control. Yeah. Well, this is... I, I haven't really kept up with it, but I know uh, once upon a time when I first got into mobile, the difficulty was that the, the camera preview was actually driven directly off of the microprocessor chip. Like, there was basically no software involvement. Maybe that's not the case anymore. Maybe we have a bit more flexibility. But uh, but it's always possible that might still be a factor in, in why we're limited in what we can do with surface views. I don't know. 
Yeah, I know that the, the new uh, camera of ICS can can modify the, the camera preview with all the face effects I've seen there. Right, but it's using the surface texture. The yeah. It's using the texture, not the surface view. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it's not good because I want to support low end version. Okay. Um, so if you, I, I'm not sure we're going to get anywhere with <laughs> this one. Basically, you need to hide, hide the camera. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And there, is there a way to give it a, pos a negative uh, position to the surface here? So it will be, I don't know, it minus 10 uh, coordinates, so it won't show up in the, the, the view. So there's a good question here in the comments. Stephen says, what about when you do set visibility, so the, the view property set visibility? When there's no visibility, there's no uh, preview buffer on some devices. So some devices, the preview doesn't show at all. Uh, yeah. What about, as Sparky suggested earlier, doing it off screen? Have you tried getting it off the bounds of the screen? Uh, I, I don't know how. I, I, I'm trying to put it on a negative uh, coordinate, but I don't, have to, don't know how to do it. Well, I don't. I haven't actually tried it, so uh, I you know, I can't give you any advice based on on first-hand experience. Okay. Um, but I'm just thinking, you know, just maybe I can do something like this. I'll uh, write in the comments. Uh, should this work? Put a, a calling on layout to the surface view with a negative coordinate. Do you think it could can work? It's worth a try. So give it a go and, and report back. Okay. It's like a frame layout or something like that. Try okay. and position outside of it. And, and if you, uh, yeah, and if, if, if it still doesn't work for you, maybe try posting your question to Stack Overflow and let us know what the URL is so that we can look at it when we're off the Hangout. OK, cool. Well, what about in one of your preview tiles, if you actually just use the actual preview as part of your app, so in one of the preview tiles, you just have the raw image, and then you know the other preview tiles have the the ones with the costumes on. Does that work? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. So in your app, you seem to have a number of tiles showing the different costumes. Yeah, and those tiles are rendered in a, a game engine I'm actually using. Okay. Those are actually sprites that I'm uh, changing the texture they are binding into. Cool. Could you actually just have like a you know an undoctored square as well, which is the actual camera preview? Uh, I have it there, but I don't want it to show up. This is the surface view. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that the, the the point is that uh, it's he isn't always showing that grid of sixteen costumes. Sometimes he wants to show just one. True. Okay. Yeah. It's actually a, a more of a tablet app now, but I also want uh, to uh, for it to work on. Uh, Phones too. Okay, well, I don't think we've got any, I think we're out of suggestions here, so if anyone wants to chime in in the comments or with any bright ideas, I think we might have to move on. Um, so lots of chats in the comments about uh, replying to uh, market feedback, so if any of you caught the discussions when we interviewed the developer console team here a couple of weeks back. Um, that came up again and it's on the radar. It's uh, kind of hopefully something we're going we're gonna to prioritize soon. But um, yeah, we want, we want to kind of come up with a good solution to that problem, but nothing to announce right now. And another question, maybe you finally can help out here. Um, Andy Lowe, at Lowe um, asked in the comments, action bar Sherlock or the um, IO shared version of um, doing an action bar? for pre-3.0 devices. Action bar Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really, really good library. Um, works on all, all the old version. I think it's 2.1 plus now, but it's good enough, right? And uh, it's, it's even uses to native when you go 4.0 or 3. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, uh, I think Action Bar Sherlock is excellent. And I have huge amounts of gratitude and thanks to Jake Wharton for all the work he's put into creating it, um, and even you can even use it on 3.0, because it adds all the new APIs added in 4.0 for the action bar, uh, even for those devices. So I think it's a fantastic library. So that's a pretty straight cut answer to that.
Sometimes, I, Stephen in the comments asked, sometimes I have a exception in the developer console, get a runtime exception when instantiating our application class. 99.999% of the time it worked without any problems. It looks like jar.lang.runtime exception unable to instantiate application com.runtastic.runtastic application. Class not found. He's getting class not found exception in the loader. Mm. Wow. And it works most of the time. That I've seen before, and it tends to be um, using an API which isn't available on the device in the onCreate method. Oh, thank you for saying that. I was going to, I was going to say that's exactly what happened to me too. But the, the only thing that throws me is he says it works most of the time. Um, is most of the time on more recent devices, though. That's the uh, okay, right, um, right. Because what happened to me was I was I was trying to do some you know, backwards compatibility and writing, um, you know, testing, you know, writing on a Nexus One and testing on a G One. And when I just I load up the class on the G One and bang, it's gone. Just like that, and and the way I solved it was to take the APIs that were causing the problems and put those into a different class. So I had I basically I had a, a base class and two subclasses, one for modern devices and one for old devices, and then I would use some reflection at startup and figure out which one I had and instantiate the right subclass. Yes, yeah, so, uh, there's also a good point to be made here that Android changed the way it used to ha it handle this. So prior to I believe 2.0. If you even reference the class, even if it was surrounded by a conditional, so you didn't execute the logic on an older device, then you would get this class step not found. I think post 2.0 it became okay. So if your baseline, if your min SDK is is 2.0, then you can just use a conditional. For example, switching on os dot build dot um, was it os dot SDK build int. The SDK int, yeah, that's that's the one. You can you can use that on 2.0, but if you don't. Um, if you need to run on older devices, you can't use that trick. Uh, you have to, like Sparky says, use some kind of um, factory pattern. is generally the best thing. So you can just switch on um, on the S on the um, SDK int, and then instantiate a different class, and that different class contains the the newer added item. So if you Google for um, have your cupcake and eat it, there's a good post on the Android developers blog about how to do that that kind of technique using using infection and so on. One of the tricks I've used is before doing a release of an application, I drop the target version right down to the lowest version. I want to support and check the errors are where I'd expect them to be, and that I've not referenced any classes sort of by accident in an on-create without realizing it. Ah, and Lint. So I think Lint has just had a new detector added, which should tell you if you're trying to access a, um, a newly added class or method, um, which isn't available in your min SDK. So yeah, make sure you've got the latest version of the ADT and um, and run lint against it against it and see if that picks up any any errors like that. So okay. If you want to see a, a super super trivial version of this factory method working, it's in the sample app that goes along with the capturing photos uh, article in Android training. So it it, you, it I use it just to switch between the old and the new method of choosing your external storage directory. Um, so super super trivial, but it does work, and it shows you how the factory messages. It's actually quite fleshed out version as well. If you look on the Android developers blog for Rito Maya, did a post, a very very good two part post on on working with location. And the sample app, which goes along with that, does a lot of this stuff. So for example, if you're running on a version of Android with strict mode, it turns it on. If you're working on a newer version, it uses different shared preferences to apply rather than commit. Um, so if you take a look at some of the the startup logic. In, in that geolocation sample, there's some good examples of doing this factory factory pattern. Cool. So, question is just come in. Can you recommend any open source charting libraries for line charts and pie charts? Anyone got any experience with charting libraries on Android? I went through about three or four of them at some point when I wanted to. In yeah. my application, I, I wrote myself. Um, I found few that kind of worked, but all of them looked quite bad. <laughs> um, so I just wrote it myself. Um, but there are a few open source ones. There are like three open source ones. 
And I, I asked that your question in Google Plus uh, when I started, and I got a lot of good comments, good comments about it. And they probably are customizable if you really dig into it. Mm -hmm. Just can't remember the names, but they are. So there's one I've heard of called A3 Charts, which is a port of the J3 Charts. Is that one that you can across? I think that's one. So I've not used it myself, but I've heard of that one as being you know, something to look at. Anyone else on there, either in the comments or, oh, Al's posted a link to A Charts. That seemed like quite a good charting library. I've, I've played around with it a bit. It seems to cover quite a lot of different types of charts. Yeah. For some stuff, if it's just really light stuff, the Google Charts um, API, I've used that in the past in some of my apps just to produce real simple visualizations like Venn diagrams and so on. It's super simple to use. You just basically add the URL parameters and get back an image. Um, but you're obviously not going to be able to do anything interactive or client side, so you know, mileage may vary there. Chart droid and yeah, there's A3 chart. So uh, who's it, who asked that question? That's Lucas. Hopefully you can see those comments in 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 the Hangout chat. That's a good point actually, Lucas. If you've not joined the Hangout, I'm not sure you can actually see all the great work that's going on with people posting links for you in the Hangout comments. So if you can join the Hangout, even if you're shy and don't have a video camera or whatever, you should be able to see all the chat. I'll post them across to the comments of the poster as well. That would be amazing. Thank you, Al. What happens to Hangout chat when the Hangout ends? It goes away. Very it zen. vanishes without a trace. Uh, but I usually, I, I usually capture that and save it into a file before, before it disappears. So the question there for um, Avatich, I'm probably really mispronouncing your name, I'm very sorry, asks, once a new app is released, when does Android Play start indexing it? I can't seem to find it. Uh, so pretty much straight away, like once you hit, like uh, once you flip the switch and turn it from draft to live in the developer console, it's just a kind of matter of time, like caching until we get the um, caches all updated so you can find it, but it's pretty much instantly. I think it's, I think it's a, an hour is about the longest I've seen. Take it I think about an hour is the longest I've seen. Um, if it's not there by an hour, there's something that you need, usually need to check on the developer console. Yeah, it seems to vary depending on incoming load, I imagine, but uh, it should be pretty quick. So did you want to invite Lucas or Abhijit to join the, the Hangout? I was just going to say, maybe for those links and stuff, we should post them as comments to the actual Hangout. Yeah, I'll just done that. Thank you, Al. Okay. No worries. Yeah, the uh, I would say the the Google Plus comment stream is is more accessible than the Hangout comment stream. Uh, Hangout comments can be persisted if I save them before I close my window and and, and publish them somewhere. But the the Google Plus comments are available immediately and forever. Okay. Do we have any more live questions from real people in the Hangout? Someone with a hand up. Hello. Hey, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm having trouble with a uh, view that seems to be requesting a relayout every time I'm invalidating it. It's a custom view of mine, mm -hmm. uh, but I've been debugging it because it was a bit laggy when it um, when I ha had it in a big size, and I noticed that it's measuring and layouting the view uh, every time the view gets invalidated, and I've tried to debug when, uh, what view or what class requests the layout, but so far I've not found anything. So how are you? How are you, how are you what? What? Sorry, how you, you said every time it's invalidated. How are you invalidating it? I'm just invalidating it with a dirty rect of the part that should be invalidated. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, I've, I've tried uh, just like overriding um, request layout and <laughs> debugging when it gets called, but it doesn't really get called, so I'm guessing it's uh, requesting a layout like for the parent or something. Mm -hmm. So my immediate concern is, are you setting any properties like in your in your draw method or anything like that? Are you setting any properties on the view which might affect 
basically. Well, actually, it, it's, I'm not changing any layout params or anything like that, and uh, I mean the width and the height and of the view should be a constant. But is there some way I could uh, debug what causes uh, the view layout to get invalidated? I thought I saw some source code somewhere that that uh, tried to to introduce sort of a I don't, I'm, I don't know a, a break is I don't know if that's the word that I want but I I thought that there was there was the possibility of sort of a, like a feedback loop where like you know request layout forces on measure which forces request layout or something like that mm -hmm. and it that's you know like so try um, try checking in. The, the source code for some of the reference applications and see how it's done in the system because um, I think this this is a, a recognized problem I just don't remember the solution right off the top of my head all right because I've I double and triple checked my code but I can't find really anything that should cause a uh, uh, an invalidation of the of the layout mm. yeah so I think there are some properties you can set which cause the view to be um, be re re measured. The best way to understand this system is uh, and there's an absolutely excellent talk on um, on writing custom layouts from Roman Guy at, uh, at DevOps, I think, two yeah. years ago. Have you seen that talk? Uh, I th it's up on Parley's work, right? Or yeah, Parley's, yeah. whatever it's called. I think I've seen like half of it. And I mean, all my I don't have this problem with any other view, really. And yep. the thing is that this view, it works perfectly. Well, not, I mean, it requests a layout all the time, but when I change the size of it, just the tiniest, so it becomes, I mean, a couple of pixels larger, it becomes lagging uncontrollably. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of weird, but I'm seeing that it gets measured way too often. Any custom component advice? No, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll just try, <laughs> try again. Hmm. Yeah, I would try that talk because that, that really does walk you through all of the um, pitfalls and what you should, must and mustn't do when creating, creating this stuff. It's really important to yeah. make sure you're, yeah, just optimizing those methods which get called again and again, like on paint, making sure you're not doing any, any kind of um, allocations or anything like that so that they're not kicking in um, during these often called uh, methods like on layout and on paint. Okay. This is a really, a really nutty hack, but uh, mm -hmm. you might tr just like sort of as a, as a blunt instrument, you might try uh, just putting in a little something that prevents on layout or on measure from being called more often than like say, I don't know, five times a second or twice a second, and just see what happens. But how could I do that? Yeah, I, I mean that would be a good hacky solution just to see if it's that that's causing the lag. That would be awesome. So I don't know. So it's not something else. Yeah, just uh, just pull this, just pull the system time and you know check it against a uh, a stored time reference. That's all. Okay, but I mean I'm not the one requesting the layout. So how can I actually? Stop I thought you were. I thought you were. Oh, I thought you had overridden that. I'm sorry. No, I had overridden it. Uh, the request layout just to check if it even gets called, but it doesn't. On layout gets called, but request layout doesn't. I was trying to see if. I see. I, I was printing um, just an exception stack trace in request layout because I wanted to see what class uh, called it, uh, but no class did. Um, so yeah. Right, but you could override it and just put in your little, put in a little check and then throw it up to the super, right? Yeah, but the thing is, it gets relayouted, but request layout isn't called. Never, never. It's okay. Well, what about on layout? Uh, what? And say so, it's a, you, I mean you could o you could override you know on layout or on measure as well. Okay, but oh yeah okay, but on layout doesn't really lay out it or yeah I don't know. I'll try. <laughs> I mean it's just a crazy idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it might be useful to just break on that point and just really like look at the stack stack for, uh, stack trace as well. Yeah, I have, and it just really shows the stack trace through. Uh, uh, all the on measure and on layout through the whole view tree. But you can't see what's causing the on, on layout. Really. No, it it goes through a bunch of views and then it ends with a native call and no more. Yeah, it's probably something setting the view is dirty and then it's somewhere 
it's, you've got to find out what it is that's marking the viewers dirty, which is like you know making it need to be relayed out. Yeah, because thing, yeah, I, I sure I mark it as dirty all the time, but uh, it shouldn't cause lay relay out if I'm not changing the size or the gravity or anything like that. I don't think, but yeah. I guess some property there internally changed something. Is your view hardware accelerated? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, the th yeah, I'll do. The thing is that this lag I was talking about, I didn't see this on like I have a. Uh, old Nexus One, and there I didn't see it, and there it isn't hardware accelerated. Um, but I haven't tried debugging it on that, so I might see if <laughs> it gets really outed there as well all the time. But I don't know. Okay, well, yeah, I'd say go to the experts, go watch that talk, which Al's pasted into the comments. Thank you, Al. Uh, where you can hear it from the guy who wrote the system telling you what to do and when. So uh, you need to get to the bottom of why on the outfit call, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Yes. All right. Sorry we couldn't help further. Uh, so Ferran asked in the comments, is it planned to release any official documentation about content provider related to SMS? Applications like GoSMS have to do it unofficially. So uh, I don't know is the answer. I doubt it. That sounds quite domain specific. I mean, if you're talking about SMS as in like, like the, the messaging system, that sounds more like an application than a, a platform feature. I guess he might be talking about accessing the um, received SMSs stored in the, the default SMS application so they can do something funky with those. Oh, oh, I see. So, so you're talking about exposing an internal content provider. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, I guess this comes down to the whole we're not going to be able to pre-announce stuff. I don't know what the folks on the SMS team are, are working on, whether that, that's a desirable feature or why they haven't done it already. Um, but it's worth trying. But it's worth asking, so. But yeah, I don't know. We're not going to be able to announce stuff like that, unfortunately. Here's another question from the same, from around, from around again. When declaring in the manifest Android um, Windows Soft Input Mode to stay visible or adjust for size, the application has the status bar activated or not. When the soft keyboard is displayed, the application has a completely different behavior. If the status bar is shown, the app resizes, otherwise the app scrolls up. Is there a way to have the same behavior and why has a different behavior? It seems like a bug. And we've seen that. So if, you, if you're showing the status bar, you get one behavior. If you're not showing the status bar, you get another behavior. So, but no one's got experience with that. I can make some random guesses. So, adjust resize is essentially going to resize your window. Um, so, the window is obviously going to be a different size if you the states by showing or not. So, I'm guessing one of them has enough room visible um, if you're hiding the status bar that it can just resize it, and that gives enough room to show the input um, input field and the keyboard. Whereas, if you're are showing the status bar, I'm guessing there's not enough room for it to show both the keyboard and the input field, so it's having to do something different. That's a guess as to why. I don't think it's actually behaving, you know, trying to implement a different functionality. I think it's just a function of how much space is left um, on the screen after the status bar is also shown. So I'd be interested in if you had like a, you know, reproducible test case, you could perhaps add a comment with a link to a Stack Overflow place would be quite handy and we can try and recreate that. That'd be good. Any other thoughts or experience with that from anyone else? <coughs> Guess not. Oh. And a follow up here on the um, how long it takes for it to become available in play. Uh, saying something it took 12 hours for it to show up in a search, a software search. So I guess there's a difference from being being searchable and findable and being coming out at the top of the results. It takes a little while for search algorithm to pick it up. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, I mean, right. It, you can find it by direct package name before you can find it on a search even for its own title, too. 
So, yeah, like you said, it's a matter of caching and indexes and things like that. Yeah, the indexes are rebuilt, I think, all the time. I don't, I don't think it's like that. It should be pretty quick. It's the same infrastructure as Google Search, so it's pretty, pretty good. Cool. Any more live questions? We seem to have exhausted questions here on uh, in the comments. I have one in the moderator here. Martin wants to know, um, can he define an input method that has keys that span multiple rows on the virtual keyboard? I have no idea. <laughs> it would be worth trying, but I don't know. Surely if you, if you create your own input method, you could have complete control over the layout though, right? Well, he's using, he's using the XML method to, to define the keyboard. Oh, the input type, you mean, rather than... I mean, uh, it's not clear from the question. Uh, but yeah, he wants he wants a more complex key key layout than just defining simple rows. Basically, he wants row spanning for the keys. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So my impression is, if you're writing your own IME, you have complete control over the layout. That's why you can do funky things like signers and people like that because it's you know your own your own view you're drawing to. So we've got the details of that. I'm not really sure I can do much. Another good question here from Michael asks if anyone knows a good example of using loaders and any advantages of using loaders. I've talked loads. Anybody else want to answer that? Well, I think my application uses loaders pretty well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a... Uh, I think that a number of good examples can be found that use loaders. So. I mean, your your classic thing is, is to is to have a content provider and a list view, and you use a loader to keep the list full. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I would agree with Al there. The the um, developer docs on loaders are pretty good. Um, so they walk you through a few examples of using it, specifically of using the cursor loader. And in my experience, um, one of my favorite features is that it handles the lifecycle events for you. So it handles um, you don't have to watch the cursor for if um, you know new um, data is added to the content provider. You don't have to worry about unhooking it and rehooking it um, in your on pause and on your resume and so on and so forth. So it really, really simplifies um, all the lifecycle events, which I found really, really helpful. One of the other things is uh, I think the start managing cursor and things like that have been deprecated in favor of loaders, and Lint will start giving you messages if you don't use loaders and you try to ma handle the management at a lower level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the, the, it, I think there's no kind of real good reason to why I'll try and like do everything with the cursor myself and managing the cursor and notifying data set change anymore. I think loaders simplify your development process so you're writing less code, which is good. Uh, and they're also, you know, in the support library so they're available back to 1.6, so there's kind of no excuse to uh, why you wouldn't really use them. But um, no, I think I think the advantages are, are pretty good mostly because it just eases your development and it's easier to kind of like integrate with the life cycle. Okay. Yeah, it goes back to my, my favorite piece of advice, which is that the, uh, the best code you can write is the code that you don't write. If somebody else has already implemented it for you, just, just patch into a hook and, and let it run. Um, and, and yeah, also getting back to, the, to your other comment, um, yeah, so I, I recently implemented this little simple uh, feed reader, which I have not released the source code yet, but probably will relatively soon. Um, and it uses fragments, and it uses a content provider and a cursor loader, and um, all that that you know it uses action bar pattern, all that great stuff. But it also works on everything from ice cream sandwich clear back to to donut uh, using the compatibility library. And it was not that hard. Good job. <laughs> Stephen asks, besides gaining audio focus, is there a way to force a media play like Winamp to stop playback? Audio focus isn't working for Winamp. Um, so I think audio focus probably is the right way to go there. It's a tough question because that comes down to like shared resources on the device, really, isn't it? You know, when trying to access the microphone and the speakers, you have to only one thing can access it at a time. Um, so I, 
unless they kind of like exposing some kind of um, service which you, they let you bind to, uh, you know, or some intent that they expose that you can send to stop it. I think the r the correct way is with audio focus, really. Is there any reason why you wouldn't use it? Is this specifically audio media? Because I mean, with a video, you can just hide the view, right? So the view view goes away, and there's nothing playing. Uh, well, I think audio focus is the way forward, so <laughs> I'd, I'd stick to that. Um, Isn't there yeah. also an audio manager that you can make use of? It's a system service, and they might be able to adjust the volume. I'm just trying to think. It is setting audio focus, isn't it? That's, I'm just thinking at a higher level. Well, so you can ask to get access to the... To you the can get... Yeah, using the audio manager, you might be able to um, get access to the current stream that's playing and just lower the volume straight down. So can you just request access to the audio sync? I think so. I'm just going to have a check on Audio Manager and see if there's any specifics for the background um, audio uh, black background media player. Okay, so that sounds well. Yeah, it comes down to the issue that there's one kind of resource and apps have to play nicely. So it sounds like. Audio manager might allow you to request access to it, and the other apps on the system might win out. Should respect that and kind of back off. And I guess if they're not doing the appropriate thing, then it's a bug. Right. Unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our office hours today, um, and I have to go. <laughs> but thank you very, very much to everyone who's joined in both live in the Hangout and commenting along on the on the announcement and watching and lurking on the um, the YouTube live stream. As always, um, it would be great if you wouldn't mind plus one the post, this, this um, Hangout post, to let us know that you are watching and that you find this kind of thing useful. Um, and yeah, see you same time next week. Thanks, guys. Thank and you. until next week, uh, keep posting your questions to Stack Overflow and let us know how to find them so that we can work on your problems uh, in all of our spare moments. So we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.